So some of you have probably taken or listened to at least a little bit of this class before, and I uh, coerced you into coming back because there are some updates. Um, not that my theology has changed, but uh, there's just some things that when I went back and watched, I thought, man, I kind of need to dig into that a little bit more and expound on that. That's a lot of meat, and we just kind of glossed over it. So I'm spending a little bit more time uh, particularly this week, week one, on our defining worship. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but uh, I didn't want to leave you guys kind of wondering and with questions or confusion on this sort of core tenet of what we're going to be talking about, because a lot of where we go after this is built on uh, our basic premise of what worship really is and who God is and who he's made us to be in his image. So we're going to start there. Um, but first, let's just talk a little bit about why this class is helpful, why it's necessary, why we feel like it's something uh, we should do. So why do we need a theology of worship, period? Um, first of all, it's because we want to worship God as God designed worship. Uh, Romans 12, 1 through 2 it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, so in Paul's letter here to the Romans, he's telling them, you need to worship God in ways that God finds good and acceptable, in ways that God has designed you to worship him. And that's part of what we're going to try to do through these six weeks is uncover the way that God wants to be worshipped because he is the, um, you have a question? Yeah. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, six weeks. I think it's six weeks. I hope so because I've got a lot to cover. Um, but we're going to uh, really try to understand, because he is the object of our worship, it only makes sense that we do uh, what he desires. Uh, which, by the way, happy Father's Day to our fathers in here. But I was going to make an analogy that, like, it's Father's Day. I get to decide what I eat for dinner tonight. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, hey, Dad, Dad makes the rules. We're going to watch the Cardinals lose again. Like, it's, <laughs> yeah, I did that for you, buddy. Um, and... Uh, you know, I get to decide because it's like, hey, it's Father's Day. Let's do what Dad wants to do. Well, every day we worship God. We want to do what God desires for us to do. We want to worship him as he desires. Uh, secondly, to engage in a fuller walk with Christ. Um, Psalm 30, 11 through 12. You've turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. And then Jam 4.10. <laughs> uh, James 4.10, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. So what we see in David's writing, what we see in James, is when we are surrendered before God and we are surrendered in worship, that it is making ourselves low, but it is also God lifting us up and exalting us and turning our mourning into dancing, loosing the uh, chains of grief, of fear, of doubt, whatever it is that have burdened us, and we can throw those off, cast those off at the feet of Jesus when we worship him. Third, and this is important, to defend against bad habits. Exodus 32, 7 through 8. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So the very people that God miraculously delivers from their slavery, from their captivity in Egypt, just a brief while later, is already making these worthless, motionless idols and saying, these are what have brought us out of Egypt. These are what have delivered us. These are our gods now, uh, because that's who we are. We so quickly turn to idolatry. And so 
uh, we build a good theology of worship to defend against bad habits because I'm telling you, we are just as much at risk of making uh, metaphorical, at least, golden calves in the church as Israel was in the desert. And lastly... Sure. Yeah, structure of our worship, um, but also I think um, doing things, yeah, particularly on a Sunday morning is the majority of what I'm thinking of here, but doing things that as a congregation do not actually lead us to surrendered worship before the Lord, that in one way or another um, point ourselves inward. Uh, at who we are and what we have done for ourselves or what we can do for ourselves or um, point us to um, a pastor or a figurehead in our congregation. Um, Other bad habits are we can do things that are selfishly driven. You know, we can we can sing songs or um, makes the kind of music that really lifts up the band and the experience of, of our performance and turn it more into a concert atmosphere. Um, but that does not serve the church and it doesn't actually worship God as he is desired to be worshiped. So, um, you know, when I say metaphorical golden calves, uh, I see it a lot just in churches that have put all of their time, money, and resources into really presenting this super polished, posh package of Sunday morning music and uh, the lighting. And, and again, we'll talk later about how I do believe like a pursuit of excellence is God glorifying. And so I don't ever think that we should like dumb ourselves down when we're playing music and we have lights on our stage, etc. So there is a fine line, but I think you can sense and some of you have probably had this experience. You can kind of sense when you walk into a church and you know what their idols are. And you know that, like, this production value is what they have really made their main thing. Um, so that's, that's kind of the main bad habit, the ha- bad habits that surround that kind of, like, self-exaltation. Uh, because, again, like we said in the other um, verses, like, if we want to be exalted, if we want to be cast off our chains and lifted up before the Lord, that begins with surrender before God, not with us putting ourselves on a pedestal. Um, Angeline and I, we can talk about this, I think, in another week where we talk about some more specific bad habits of uh, worship. But we attended a church in Florida. Uh, we were so excited because um, her family members who hadn't really been in an evangelical church before uh, we were visiting them for Thanksgiving years ago, and they invited us to go to a church. And we were like, that's so awesome. And then I found out it was an SBC church, and I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. Um, and then we got there and just were instantly deflated. Um, we passed a lot of golden calves before we even got to our seats. <laughs> like they had a, um, and again, these things aren't evil in themselves. But just trust me that in the context of where we were, it was not pointing people to Christ. But we pa- they had a Starbucks, like an actual Starbucks franchise in the lobby. Um, they had an oxygen bar. Which I, didn't know, I didn't know that was a thing, but that's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> just like people with like, hey, how's it going? Um, they had, uh, they had one of those newsboys like drum risers that like spins you know, and like tilts the drummer around. They, do that during the worship. they did it during the worship. <laughs> Doug has turned it down over and over again. I can't get him on board. <laughs> uh, right. They, the most like offensive one though was um, they said, they literally said as they were dismissing after the worst sermon we've ever heard. This is pre-COVID. This is pre, yeah, this, is, this was like 2015 or something. Uh, they said, um, by the way, don't forget to grab your communion on the way out. And so we're, so we're walking out in like, you know, this like sacred thing. And it's literally on tables just like that one where we have our sign-in sheets, just little shot glasses 
and like crackers, and people are like, so where are you going to go for lunch today, you know, <laughs> like, and they're just like tossing it in the trash can, like zero reverence, uh, zero fencing in of the table of who should or should not participate, like I was like, have you all read Paul, like <laughs> this place is going to burn down, like I don't want to be here when the lightning comes, um, so there's obviously you can even be an SBC church because we're very autonomous. There's a wide gamut of what you can find in SBC churches and have, like those poor folks, a very bad theology of worship. And that plays out in some really bad habits and some really bad theology. So that's our last point is we want to defend against bad theology. Ephesians 4, 14. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to be tossed to and fro. Um, if you've ever turned on TV late at night when you're sick and found a televangelist, you've heard some, uh, some cunning and some crafty schemes and, right, <laughs> yeah, just touch the screen. I'll send you some, uh, some blessed water in a little packet. Um, so there's all kinds of bad theology and part of having a good theology of worship is not having a bad theology of worship, and, but also not having a bad theology elsewhere because our theology of worship does shape uh, a lot of our theology at large because part of what we do at Buck Run and in a, most really healthy churches is we sing and we proclaim things that are true, that, that teach us and instruct the body of Christ and remind us of the truths of Scripture uh, and that's part of our theology of worship. And so in doing that, it instructs and it builds up and expands our theology at large. Um, so that's why, that's why we need a theology of worship. Now let's talk a little bit about defining worship. We're going to go through just a few definitions here and uh, settle on one that we're really going to dig into. Uh, Jonathan Gibson says, worship is the right fitting and delightful response of moral beings, angelic and human, to God the creator, redeemer, and consummator, for who he is as one eternal God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and for what he has done in creation and redemption, and for what he will do in the coming consummation, to whom be all praise and glory, now and forever, world without end. Amen. He wasn't going to leave anything uncovered. You know what I mean? He's like, we're covering all the bases if I'm going to define worship. Which, by the way, I want to challenge you sometime to like work on a definition of worship. Like, figure out what worship means to you. When you sit down and try to define it, it's harder than you think. Um, because I think it's something that is, uh, by the Holy Spirit, placed into the hearts of regenerate believers. But it's also a little bit trickier to define. Which is why this is helpful. Uh, Daniel Block says, true worship involves reverential acts of homage and submission before the divine sovereign in response to his gracious revelation of himself and in accord with his will. So there's a lot here. The, all these definitions are great, by the way. I'm not going to like say, I hope you didn't like Daniel Blocks because it was bad. All of these are good and helpful. Um, but I like that Daniel hits on things here like it involves reverential acts, because we think of that a lot. We think of um, giving of our tithes. We think of kneeling at the altar. We think of raising our hands and singing in worship. But he also hits at submission. We're going to really talk about that in the next few weeks of the idea of surrendered worship. Um, and it's in response to his gracious revelation. So there's a lot there of just who God has in his mercy is revealed to us, and in accord with his will. So again, it's to worship God as God designed worship. Bruce Leafblad says, Worship is communion with God in which believers, by grace, center their minds, attention, and hearts' affection on the Lord, humbly glorifying God in response to his greatness and his word. So there's a little bit of like eliminating distractions in his definition, right? That true worship involves like a focused mind, a focused heart on who God is. And again, humbly glorifying God, so it's the surrender, and again, in response to his greatness. So we're responding to something. John Piper, the inner essence of worship is to know God truly and then respond from the heart 
to that knowledge by valuing God, treasuring God, prizing God, enjoying God, being satisfied with God above all earthly things. And then that deep, restful, joyful satisfaction in God overflows in demonstrable acts of praise from the lips and demonstrable acts of love in serving others for the sake of Christ. A couple things here I want you to remember. Uh, first of all, if you've ever read John Piper, you know that this definition kind of hits at sort of the heart of his ministry of like enjoying God and desiring God above all other things. He always, um, he kind of made his career on this idea of Christian hedonism, that we should be joyful people because we have this incredibly good God, and that should make us joyful. And so he talks about worship being prizing, enjoying, being satisfied with God. Um, and then in that satisfaction, that overflows, and I really want you to remember that word, overflows, in demonstrable acts of praise and acts of love. So this joy overflows into acts of praise and acts of love in serving others for the sake of Christ. Bob Coughlin from just down the road says, Christian worship is the response of God's redeemed people to his self-revelation that exalts God's glory in Christ in our minds, affections, and wills in the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, Bob, if you haven't checked out his stuff, he has a uh, website called worshipmatters.com or maybe .org, I don't remember, uh, that I definitely recommend checking out. But he has, I think, like a six-part series uh, of articles on uh, defining worship. And so he starts with this definition and then breaks down each piece of it. It's really, really helpful, definitely worth checking out. And then Harold Best uh, says, Worship is the continuous outpouring of all that I am, all that I do, and all that I can ever become in light of a chosen or choosing God. And this is from his book, Unceasing Worship. I forgot to bring my copy, but did you bring your copy, Michelle? A plus. All right. So this is what his book looks like. This is, yeah. <laughs> this is Unceasing Worship by Harold Best. Um, almost everything that we're going to cover the rest of the day today um, comes from this book. And I highly recommend it. It is, uh, it's very philosophical. It's very heady. It's just kind of how he writes. It's not, it doesn't read like um, with a lot of like academic jargon. It reads more like a, art, like a, like a philosophical artist wrote it. Um, and so you have to kind of like, you almost wish you could like tap him on the shoulder and be like, focus, Harold. Where are we going? <laughs> but, it sends you down, like I've told you, it sends you down on this rabbit hole. Yes. Right, yeah, lockdown made it possible. Yeah, if you've ever seen those, like, true crime documentaries where they've got, like, the red string, like, attaching all the different images, if you charted Harold Best's book, that's kind of what you'd end up with, like, just all over the place. But it's worth the endeavor, and what, I've, what I have tried to do and what I hope I will accomplish today is we're going to break down this idea of unceasing worship today and... Uh, that's something that we're doing different from previous years when we've done this, because I really want us to have some solid ground to stand on here and not be afraid of this concept, even though it is a little bit heady and philosophical, because I think it's valuable, and I think it gives us a really helpful framework for how we see the rest of Christian life and worship as it flows from us. So let's talk a little bit about this definition, and then we'll get more into um, breaking down what he means here. But he says, worship is the continuous outpouring of all that I am, all that I do, and all that I can ever become in light of a chosen or choosing God. So what do you notice um, about that last line, chosen or choosing God? What sticks out to you there? Yes, but this God is lower G, right? Because... Everyone worships. That's what he's getting at here, is that you're right, Josh, that this choosing God, that's Yahweh. That's our God that has chosen us and called us out. The chosen God, that's our idols. And so what he is saying in this definition of worship is that everyone worships. 
and everyone worships all the time. It's just that Christians who have been called apart from our lostness and saved and regenerated, we worship the one true God. Everyone else never stops worshiping. They worship all the way until their death. Um, and so that's why this definition is not his definition of Christian worship. It's worship in general. Um, and his hypothesis is that all of us are worshipers all the time before and after Christ. So let's look at this idea of continuous outpouring, which is kind of what he thinks is happening in the human nature. Continuous, uh, he kind of breaks down why he uses this terminology. Continuous, because it means like relentless, ceaseless, faithful, and outpouring, because it means flowing, lavish, generous, giving of oneself. And he kind of talks about this idea of like a garden hose. If you just turn on the spigot and hold the hose, it is continuously outpouring, right? And we can do things, like when we're watering the garden, you can put your thumb and you can direct it at certain things. But that as built into our human nature, we are continuously flowing out. We are worshiping, adoring, we are giving of ourselves to other things. Before we go on, I just want to say that um, outpouring... We're going, to, we're going to use that word a lot, and uh, Harold Best used that word a lot. Just remember that it is, it is a word. <laughs> it's one word in one language, and it cannot possibly bear the weight of all of the mysteries that we're going to ascribe to it. It's, our language just can't really handle it. But I think it might be the best fit. I think that's why Harold chose it. He even wrestles with this in this book of, like, we've got to, we've got to pick something to call this. And I think outpouring is the most appropriate, even though it may not fully encompass what we're trying to wrestle with. Um, and so he kind of gives us some reasons why. First of all, there's um, some great places where we can see worship as pouring throughout Scripture. Our first use is in Genesis 35:14. This is the very first account that we have of what's called a drink offering or a libation. So Genesis 35, 14 says, this is after God spoke to Jacob. And it says, And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. So there's this, uh, right in the very first book of the Bible, this image of pouring out of something that is valuable. Because remember, this is, you know, in Israel... Uh, water is valuable, <laughs> right? This is, a, this is a significant offering. Uh, and it may have been water, it may have been wine. A lot of drink offerings were wine, but a lot of wine was what they were going to have for hydration. So um, it, the, this point still stands that this is a valuable thing that you were giving up before the Lord. You were pouring out this drink offering. Um, and you even still hear this like, in modern, like, secular cultures, like, pour one out for the homies. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, first time that's been said in adult discipleship, probably. I don't know. Chris has probably said it. Um, but, but this idea of just, like, giving up and pouring out is not, uh, it hasn't been forgotten. It's, for some reason, it's still intertwined in us because we realize that that is a valuable thing and we're just draining it out in this, like, lavish wastefulness for some reason, to honor something and to, to worship something. Um, the drink offerings or libations were part of the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. Uh, so you can see this in uh, Leviticus where we kind of get the law. There are different uh, requirements for what uh, makes a worthy drink offering and how it should be used. And obviously, we are beyond like that sacrificial system of the law, but it's important to know that in the beginning, that this was built into uh, Israel's system of worship. Uh, we also see it in Psalm 19, 1 through 2. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. So the picture that David's painting here is that uh, the majesty of the heavens and of all creation is constantly just overflowing 
outpouring a testimony of who God is as creator. Um, that we have this ongoing, ceaseless testimony of worship that we see in the stars. Uh, every time we send out a telescope that goes further than the last one, we just keep unveiling more and more testimonies of God. It never ceases. And you think like, I, I like to imagine that there have been these, you know, these galaxies that are so far away that uh, were completely unseen before Hubble got there. And so I just think, man, for, for thousands of years, these galaxies were there just singing the praises of God, declaring the glories of who God is as creator to no audience other than God himself. Only God and his heavenly hosts could hear and receive that testimony. And we just are beginning to scratch the surface and get a glimpse of it. So day to day, it pours out speech. Uh, John 12, 3. This is where um, Jesus is back in the home uh, after Lazarus had been raised from the dead, and Mary is there, and Mary pours out her perfume to wash the feet of Jesus. Um, it says, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And then this is important. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. There, in her pouring out of this expensive offering before the feet of Jesus, it, it changed the atmosphere in the whole room. It completely, it filled the house. And that's part of, uh, again, that's built into this idea of outpouring, is that there is this lavish wastefulness to it. Um, but wastefulness in the sense that it is an honor to God, rather than as how Judas received it. Because you remember when Judas sees this, Judas says, why did you let her do that? Like, we could have sold that and given it to the poor, which, of course, we realize he wasn't some, like, social justice warrior. He was going to steal that money. Like, that's just kind of how he worked. Um, so Judas receives it, it, you know, similar to how uh, other scripture has said that, like, our worship is a stench of life unto life and death unto death. So Judas, Judas receives this as, like, a foul stench, but Christ receives it. The other believers in the room receive it as an aroma of worship. Um, so again, this pouring out image. And then 2 Timothy 4, 6. This is Paul being poured out as a drink offering. It says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. This is, as Paul is reaching the end of his days on earth, reaching the end of his ministry, and he even knows that in this idea of pouring out, that he is, he's just about dry, <laughs> right? Like it's just about reached the end of his sacrifice. And what a glorious picture that he knows that like my time here is almost done because there's only so much more I can pour out of myself. But he knows that his hope is in Christ and that he will be in the presence of Christ where that communion and that outpouring will be ceaseless and he won't have to worry about that end. And then we look at Calvary. Two parts here. The wrath of God poured out on Christ. And Christ's blood poured out uh, as atonement for our sins. Um, the most powerful picture of Scripture, the, the most redeeming, saving picture of pouring out that we have in Scripture, is that God's holy wrath reserved for us was poured out onto the sinless Lamb of God, and His blood was poured out for us. So that's just a look at kind of where, um, where Harold Best and, and others have seen this image of outpouring and pouring out and the sacrificial gift of pouring throughout Scripture. And this is his quote here. He says, Outpouring surpasses measuring out or filling quotas, even to the extent that it does not matter if some of it spills out in gracious waste. Uh, in that same chapter, he talks about if Mary had given just a tithe of her ointment to wash Jesus' feet, would that have been, uh, would that have had the same effect? You know, it's a totally different story uh, if that's the case, and it has a different lesson if that's the case. And I'm not encouraging you to not tithe. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that in this act of worship, she didn't give 10% of her, 
of this precious ointment. She just poured it all out. And it was probably a really strong smell, you know, like putting on too much cologne. But the act of it made it a sweet aroma. So let's keep breaking down continuous outpouring. Um, I've got a lot to cover, and I can already tell that I'm moving faster than I thought I would. So I'm going to try to not go too fast. But this is, um, this is where it gets a little bit deeper. And so trade your snorkel for scuba gear, and we're going to go deeper here, and we're going to be fine. Um, but this is really good, rich stuff that I don't want you to miss. So this is um, how we see continuous outpouring in different contexts. And again, all of this is laying the foundation for our theology of worship and what we believe um, God has designed for us to do in response to him. So let's look at continuous outpouring and the nature of God. First, we see outpouring in the Trinity. Uh, The Trinity existed in perfect communion before time. It was fully satisfied, fulfilled, harmonious, and loving. Um, Without going too much into it, because we could write, I mean, we could read like entire books on what the Trinity was doing before creation. Um, But what we believe is that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that they were in existence before, uh, before the earth was created, and that they were fully satisfied. They were lacking nothing. They didn't need us. Uh, God was not uh, just twiddling his thumbs thinking, man, I I wish I had some like little peons to entertain me. That wasn't the goal. Um, So this continuous outpouring of God to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, I would draw this, but I'm afraid I'd accidentally make a heresy, so I'm just going to not draw it. But but this continuous outpouring one into each other of perfect communion. So that's where we see it originally is in the existence of the Trinity before time. And then we see outpouring in creation. We see this infinite imagination, creativity, love, and grace. Um, I think that reading Best book has shaped the way that I read Genesis now. When I read the creation account, um, I've it's changed how I've read it in different different times of my life, right? Like when I was younger, I read it and I pictured the felt board that I learned it on, you know? And then you get a little bit older and I read it with like confusion because I'm reading it in light of what uh, I'm learning at school about evolution and uh, how old different things are. And I'm wondering like, does this jive? Does this make sense? And then at some point someone introduces you to Ken Ham and then you read it with anger because you're like, all of you are wrong. <laughs> and you read it with like a Ken Ham fist slamming the table. And then I think you read it through the lens of Harold Best. And uh, what I see is this creator. And I, as a creative, I totally missed the creator aspect of creation. Uh, because for me, it was just I have to put walls up and defend the faith and defend that this is real and this is literal. Um, And in doing that and getting so fortified and militant about it, I missed a lot of the beauty of creation. And the beauty is, and just as a sidebar, I do believe in a literal six-day creation. I'm not trying to like sidestep that. But um, what I missed was the glory of it. And if you read Genesis and you read the creation account, with this idea that this is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, fully satisfied, needing nothing, and this is just an outflowing, an outpouring of perfect, infinite imagination, infinite creativity, infinite love, infinite grace, making the most beautiful things he could make. And we only get a glimpse of it because we only see uh, the broken, fractured version of it, right? Right? We can only imagine what it was like before the fall and how beautiful it was. Um, So I encourage you to read it with that lens of the glories of it. And again, as a creative person, I am so challenged and inspired by the fact that we exist as sub-creators and that our goal is to glorify the chief creator. And we can see all of that in creation. 
Um, Harold Best says, even in his satisfying completeness, God decided not to keep himself to himself. That's a beautiful way to look at creation. That God was fine, but he just wanted to share himself, his glorious grace with someone else. Let's look at Colossians 1, uh, 1, 16 through 17. It says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is Jesus that he's talking about. Hebrews 1, uh, verse 3, he says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So all things have come through him. Uh, you even see this kind of outflowing, outpouring, as in that Jesus is the radiance and the glory of God. Um, and that he upholds all things by the word of his power. Harold Best says, Thus right now, and for as long as God himself decides it to be so, creation is being held together by the outpouring word of his Son, in whom and through whom all things come into being and consist. So this is how we see continuous outpouring in the nature of who God is. We see it in the Trinity, we see it in creation, and we see it in the way that Jesus, the living word of God, holds all things together. Any questions about this before we move on? All right, let's look at continuous outpouring in the Imago Dei. The Imago Dei just means the image of God. All of us are created in the image of God. Um, I would love to, see, maybe we have before, I would love to see a class uh, just on the image of God and all of its vast implications because it is deep and it is so rich to dig into. But I mean, yeah, not me. Uh, <laughs> I want to hear it. I don't want to do it. <laughs> um, but just the way that we as Christians value every single human being on earth because of the Imago Dei, that there is no one that's not worth loving and respecting and honoring because we believe that they are the imprint nature of God himself, um, that they are created in his image. Um, it's a huge factor in uh, our pro-life stance and our understanding of uh, the quality of life, the importance of life, um, is that we hold that to be true even in the womb. Uh, so let's look at Genesis together. Uh, we're going to start, we're going to hop around a little bit. Genesis 1, 27 to 28, uh, which is the creation of man. And then we're going to look into how God uh, created Eve as well. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds and over the heavens and of every living thing that moves on the earth. So pause right there. Do you see immediately how he created male and female in his image? And then he told them to flow out, <laughs> you know, to be poured out, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth, enjoy this incredible, beautiful thing that I have given you. So again, just this expanding, pouring nature written into our DNA from the very beginning. And we hop down to chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, so he's going back in time a little bit before uh, Eve. He says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And then jumped to verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So even out of the, 
the outflowing of the very first person comes the very next person. <laughs> and from them comes all of humankind. Uh, so God has created and, and put this outpouring into his uh, Imago Dei, into his image. And because we already believe that God is the continuous outpourer, we bear his image as continuous outpourers. Um, this is something that we believe God has done from beginning, and so it makes sense that as his image bearers, as those who are carrying on his mission and beginning this long arc of the gospel, that we are his uh, image bearers as continuous outpourers. Now, this is really important. We are not created to worship, and we are not created for worship. We are created as worshipers. And that's important because it is based off of our already established understanding of the continuous outpouring of the Trinity and their self-sufficiency. If we were created to worship, then that would mean that that would almost imply that God was lacking something, and that's why he made us. Uh, if we were created for worship, then that kind of implies this sense that at some point we graduate into worshipers. But what we believe is that we were created as worshipers. We were worshiping from the very beginning. And again, this is that hose. God turns on the spigot, and it just it's bubbling out. Um, and so we are not created to worship. We're not created for worship. We are created as worshipers. And that worship um, never ceases. By nature, God cannot worship, even though he continuously pours out. But everything that worship is on the human side is an outpouring of what it means to be made in the image of God. So why does, it say that by, why does Harold say that by nature, God cannot worship? Yeah, exactly. He's the ultimate. What's he going to worship? And because built into worship is surrender and submission and lowliness. And God is not going to surrender to anyone. Um, so God cannot worship, but uh, his continuous pouring out that we have received as his image bearers for us in, in our, in our pre-fall state, that was just pure worship. So what we want to see then is that God... We're going we're gonna to talk about a little bit about the difference between who God is and who man is and how the image works here. But God is, here I'm going to back up, sorry. God is what Harold calls the unique infinite, okay? So we're going to put God up here at the top. Give him a little crown. So there's God. Unique infinite. There's no one like him, and he is endless. He's the unique infinite. And that he has this continuous outpouring of lordship unto creation, man. So I'm going to put man down here. And also I'll do a little sidebar. This is creator down here, creation. So God's continuous outpouring as a unique infinite flows this direction in the form of lordship. Because again, he cannot worship because he is the ultimate being. There's nothing to surrender to, nothing to submit to. His continuous outpouring of love, of relational grace, of everything that we need to sustain ourselves flows out of him in the form of lordship over us, over man. So then who is man? Man is the image of God. So we're the reflection, the imprint, the fingerprint of this unique infinite. But we are unique finite. We do have an end. We do have a beginning. We are not from time before time. 
uh, God is. There is no beginning. There is no end to God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. We are not. We are the unique finite against his unique infinite. And we have this, we were made to have, we were created to have in the garden a continuous outpouring of worship unto creator God. So our outpouring flows this way in the form of worship. So this is, this is Eden before like some snakes started chatting. This is Eden, right? So God, unique, infinite, walking among the garden with his creation. Everything is happy. This outpouring of love, grace, mercy that he calls lordship over man, his creator, who has a beginning, so he's finite. And the response then is this continuous outpouring of worship, of grateful surrender before their Lord. So then something happens. Then things get a little messed up. We, uh, well here, actually I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's, before we kind of talk about uh, how messed up we are, well, I will say this. We, we already know, like I'm not, this isn't like a spoiler alert. We already know that we, we screwed up in the garden. So our continuous outpouring today, before we, know, before we have Christ, instead of flowing up, our, our worship is flowing outwards towards other things, right? So we cannot, it is not rightly directed. So if you think about that hose again, it's just bubbling over, um, watering all of the weeds around us rather than being aimed at where it's supposed to go. So this is our brokenness. And we're going to talk more about the fall in a second. But let's talk about uh, continuous outpouring in Christ, that's supposed to say sojourn, Christ sojourn on earth. Uh, we can learn much about worship from Christ's sojourn on earth, and uh, here's some of the reasons why. Because he demonstrated that there was no fatal flaw in God's original creating act. Uh, meaning that when we look at Jesus, when we look at his life and ministry on earth, we see what should have been, right? We see a perfect, sinless man, and we also see what we cannot achieve. Some interesting things to think about is that he faced greater temptation than Adam and Eve. What was Eve tempted with? Forbidden fruit, knowledge, some insight. Um, and she gave into that temptation. Adam gave into that temptation. They fell. When Jesus, if you read the account, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, when Jesus is whisked away by Satan himself and tempted, um, he's tempted at a time of, of weakness, right? He was fasting. He was hungry. Uh, he's tempted in the midst of a world that's already been broken for centuries, not in the midst of a perfect garden. He lives sinlessly in a corrupt world, swirling with sinful chaos and evil schemes. He was in the middle of brokenness. Even think about, you know, when Scripture says at the right time God sent his son, there's a lot to unpack there. But if you look at just the political environment that God, that God sent Jesus into the world, you know, Israel was in captivity under a very corrupt, a very wicked government in Rome. Um, so he's, he is there as uh, part of the Trinity and seeing his own people being oppressed under this wicked government, mistreated. He's seeing his people um, worship idols and not understand the coming of the Messiah. So he's, he's in a much darker place than Adam and Eve were in. And I hadn't really thought about that before, that like God's... Uh, ability to live sinlessly, Christ's ability to live sinlessly, is in such a contrast to Adam and Eve's fall because they, they, they messed up in the perfect scenario. They were in this sin vacuum, and they still found a way to sin. Here Jesus is. He's starving. He's weak. 
He's emotionally suffering because he knows what's coming in the days ahead. Um, and Satan takes him away and says, why don't you just, you have the power. Just turn these stones into bread. Who's going to know? And it's all back to the same lie of, did God really say? You know, it's, that, it's all built on that same thing. Um, but he responds with, no, like, man does not live on bread alone. His perfect response is uh, a great example for us of what worship should look like, that no matter the circumstances, no matter the temptation, we remain steadfast and surrender to God's will and God's ways. Um, so that puts in, that adds a new character here that changes everything. So we have Christ. Let's see, I'll put him in the center here. Right. <laughs> so we have Christ, who is achieving two things at the same time. He's achieving two worlds at the same time. He is fully God and fully man. That's central doctrine. We can't, we can't walk away from that. So God is fully God. Or Christ is, Jesus is fully God. He is every bit as much God as he was before he descended from heaven and every bit as much God after. But he is fully man as well. And that's super important to our understanding of the gospel and his redemption. So that means that simultaneously he is unique infinite and unique finite. Uh, he was born in a manger. But so that aspect of him has that beginning and it had that end at the cross. Uh, but he, Christ himself is not finite, right? He is part of this unique infinite. So he is perfectly and mysteriously balancing both of these at the same time. So he, as God, has this continuous outpouring or he, he, as man, has this continuous outpouring of worship unto the Creator. But as Christ, as the Messiah, has this continuous outpouring of lordship unto creation. And in doing so, he demonstrated perfect worship. And he demonstrated the perfection of God's design. It's so important that he was able to accomplish this and that it wasn't just one side or the other because we needed to have that demonstration, but also we needed a, a human, a man, to bear that wrath, of, of, to bear God's wrath, but it had to be of holy blood as well. There's so much to unpack here of who Christ is, um, but he is the missing piece and the cornerstone of the gospel for this reason. Right, So this goes beyond even just how we worship. This goes how we understand salvation. This is who Christ is and how he works among us and how he saves us. So again, let's, look at, let's think some more about the continuous outpouring and the fall. So sin has infected and inverted our natural ability to rightly worship. So that's kind of what I hinted at here. Um, we're, let's, let's read together. Let's read Deuteronomy uh, can I actually have someone else read Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 11 through 20? It's a little bit of a long passage, but it's important. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm going to bring this over here just so we can all see it a little bit better. I'm just going to have theology of worship in the middle of it, but that's fine. So this is a great warning against what we see in our natural tendencies of worship. He's saying, don't forget who God is. Don't forget what he has done for you and start thinking about what? Your safety, your fullness, your riches, thinking this is my power, this is my might that has delivered me. That is a perfect passage to show exactly how quickly we can fall into our idols of ourselves these are some of the bad habits. This is some of the bad theology that we have to guard against, lest we forget our Lord God, lest we perish. Um, it immediately, once he begins to have this fullness, this safety, all of his continuous outpouring is towards himself and towards his comfort. How much do you see this 
um, just among like your, your lost coworkers, uh, your lost friends who their homes, their cars, their jobs, all of that, those are their gods. Those are their idols. Those are the things that they find safety in and they, because they are just bubbling over, they have this outpouring and they don't know where to direct it. They don't know uh, who has given them all of these things. They cast off the creator and put it straight onto the creation. So it's just flowing out and it's watering the weeds. They are seeing all of these common grace benefits and worshiping them instead of rightly aiming it back towards God in worship. Um, oh, no, we need... Exactly, exactly. When, when those things fail, there's nothing left. Um, and, you know, I'm sure many of you have had this experience of having a friend or a family member pass away um, and uh, going into that mourning process, maybe even the funeral planning process, depending on how close you are with these people, with, with folks who are not believers. Have you ever been through a funeral planning process with someone who doesn't know Christ? It's a very different experience, right? I, am, I was sheltered growing up by having a mostly Christian family with even mostly Christian extended family and seeing it in my church. Uh, but then when my grandfather passed away uh, a few years ago, I was reminded because he, he had been married before and he had this other family that I didn't have a ton of communication with. And just seeing the way that like they respond to these things and uh, the way that you can just watch their world fall apart and they scramble for safety and security. Uh, you know, that's why like fighting over wills is a big thing because there's what, riches and safety and fullness. And when those are in danger, uh, because you don't know how a document is going to disperse them, then that's essentially saying, I don't know what's going to happen with my God. I don't know where my gods are going to land. Will I receive them? Will they go to my brother? What's going to happen? Um, So you're right. When those things are taken away, you know, then they feel hopeless. They feel like that there's no true recipient of what is bubbling out of them. Uh, we turn from the one God we were, and we were given innumerable false gods. But the faucet was not turned off. The hose was just misdirected. And apart from Christ, we are continuous idolaters. And that's... Uh, so important to remember, and that's what we see throughout secular culture. Um, we have cell phones in our pockets. We have the ability to access the most outrageous idolatry you can imagine in every form, and it's everywhere. Uh, and it's tempting to us, and it ropes us in, even as believers. Um, the idolatry of self, of sex, of uh, fashion, of security, um, whatever it is, all of those temptations have been bottled up and just put at like immediate access at our hip at all times. And I don't think we're really fully understanding yet the implications of that. I think we're seeing, we're going to see that more over the next few years of how much that's messing us up. Um, Basically, all of the idols we could ever want have been put at our fingertips. And so that's why it's so important for us to, in our hearts, in our habits at home, to have this theology of worship grounding us so that we can resist and flee those temptations. Um, so this is, this is the sad, destructive result of the fall, but we are not left comfortless. Christ has come. That's how Harold Best ends this chapter one. We are not left comfortless. Christ has come. And so next week, we're going to build on this, and we're going to understand the importance of Christian worship. Because remember, all of this is laying the foundation for worship at large. This is how humans have this continuous outpouring from them in response to being made by a continuous outpourer. And so next week, we're going to start really unpacking what Christian worship looks like 
and uh, eventually as we progress, we'll see um, how it shapes who we are at Buck Run, why we do the things that we do, why we don't do some of the things that we do, why by God's grace, we don't look like the church that Angelina and I visited in Florida. And if we ever get there, just fire me, please. <laughs> um, but we're going to see, again, this is kind of like the really important foundation. And then we're going to get more and more practical each week of what this looks like in practice here at Buck Run.